Another funny thing. I don't know if I should say this or not. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Every single filmmaker who is, that is a bad guy in their movie that's supposed to be a secret wants to murder me right now. Hello, I'm Ryan Johnson. I wrote and directed Knives Out, and this is Notes on a Scene. Now you heard something. Spill it. I just heard two things. my will and then there was more yelling and then I heard Ransom say I'm warning you Ransom so this is one of the first scenes where Chris Evans character Ransom has just shown up and it's right before the family is going to read the will and Chris has breezed into it and kind of thrown everybody into chaos so this was also kind of the first scene where we actually had everybody on set at once. And with these actors coming together to play like in an ensemble, it was so much fun. It was because everyone showed up just ready to play. The way it feels in the movie that everyone's kind of having fun, that's genuinely the way it was on set. So Jamie Lee Curtis, who I love so much, she and Daniel and some of the other actors, everybody was kind of setting the tone on set. The fact that when all of these people came together, I'll be honest, I had no idea it was a bunch of movie stars, most of whom I've never, all of whom I've never worked with before. I had no idea how it was gonna go on set and whether it was gonna be a nightmare, I had no clue. But you get good people on set like Jamie and you show up on set and there's just this warm inviting atmosphere and everybody's playing with each other and everybody's having fun. Instantly, everybody just kind of gels, and actors like Jamie, besides being fantastic on screen, that's one of the great things she brings to it. Oh boy. This frame is actually a good example of one thing I tried to do a lot, which is, you can see there's kind of a triangular shape to it in terms of Jamie here in the center, uh, Michael on the left, and then Don on the right with Ransom in the background. But it creates, it gives the frame depth, and there's all but always several layers of people to look at in the scene at any given time. Also, a little shout out to the props department and know that any time a clock or a phone is in set, somebody has paid very close attention to the time and has made sure, has like asked me what time it's supposed to be in the actual scene. Uh, the will reading we said is gonna be like at 10.30 or 11 or something. And so it made sense that at this moment in the story, it was 10.15 in the morning. Thank you, props. Also, another funny thing, I don't know if I should say this or not. <laughs> not because it's like lascivious or something, but because it's gonna screw me on the next mystery movie that I write. But forget it, I'll say it. it's very interesting. Apple, they let you use iPhones in movies, but, and this is very pivotal if you're ever watching a mystery movie, bad guys cannot have iPhones on camera. So, oh no! Every single filmmaker who is, that is a bad guy in their movie that's supposed to be a secret wants to murder me right now. Let's see what Jamie's saying. Now you heard something. Spill it. Jaden Martell, who plays Jacob, first of all, he's just like insanely kind and so smart and also such a cool kid. I've been like going to premieres and like seeing him of the, and going to like different press things and he always shows up and he just like looks like he stepped off the cover of a magazine. He's always wearing like the coolest stuff. I think Jaden actually wins the sweater game here with this, uh, with the pink shirt and the, and the lines. It's just, it, it all lines up. I just heard two things. my will and then there was again always looking for ways composition wise to get more than one actor depth wise into the frame so you have a couple things you have Blanc who is absorbing all this you've got Marta who is watching Blanc because she's very nervous she's trying to at this point in the story kind of fool him and then deep background you've got Noah Segan which is always fun to have Noah Segan in the frame and then Harlan looking over it all as the portrait a little technical thing. When we started shooting the movie, we didn't have the painting. It wasn't done yet. We had done a bunch of revisions to it and we just didn't have artwork that we were happy with yet. So when we actually shot this and every single shot that you see in the movie that has the painting in it was a green screen. We just had green inside the frame and we had some amazing effects guys who went in there and comped. We took like a high, high quality photo of the painting and they comped it in for every shot. Not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll 
Also, Daniel Craig wasn't there for the entire shoot. He just did all of his stuff on the green screen stage in one day. That now it's not true. Daniel was so dialed in. It's funny then the scene he's not talking at all because I'm about to talk about the, like the last thirty minutes of the movie where he just talks the entire time. And Daniel showed up for, to shoot those like last thirty pages and had the whole thing memorized like it was a stage play. He just had it. Down. He could have done. I ended up like throwing out all my little shots and going for longer and longer takes so that I could just let give him runway so that he could just keep going because he had it down. And the longer you gave him, the better it the better it got. And Anna de Armas as Marta, who again does is mostly listening for this scene, but um, you know this is Anna has done great work before and she's been working for a while, but compared to how high profile most of the other actors were in this movie, she was one of the lesser known actors who were shown up. And she is, again, really the center of the film. And for Anna to step into the center of the movie with the confidence that she had and really carry the film to the extent she did, I, I, I just think she's extraordinary. It was more yelling. And then I heard Ransom say, I'm warning you. So this is a good example of Michael Shannon being, you would not maybe expect this, but he was the funniest person on set. And so this little like football goal gesture that he does, um, which cracked me up on the day, that was entirely just him coming up with that. But there were a lot of lines, we're gonna get to a line down, down the road, which were some of the funniest things in the movie that Michael just came up with on the day. <laughs> this cookie right here <laughs> inside his mouth. Uh, I'm so happy I have this pen. You would never know what I was talking about. Mmm, oh, yum. Look at those cookies. Delicious. These are these Belgian cookies right here. And uh, actually, when we screened the movie at the Ghent Film Festival in Belgium, everyone was so excited that we had these cookies in there because they were like, Belgian cookies. Uh, they're very buttery. And I picked them just because I thought they looked cool. And then poor Chris. Anytime you see an actor eating food in a scene, pity that actor because they've had to eat that food all day long and these cookies you eat like two of them and you feel you, like your throat is coated in butter and Chris was pounding these all day long so I, I, I feel very bad for him. And some? What's that mean? With this it's all about blocking and blocking or staging was kind of my big lesson in this movie. Anytime there's um, multiple people in the frame especially, trying to figure out how to line up your shots. First of all, so there's depth so that it's not just kind of a police lineup with everyone on the same frame, but then also so there's kind of like a shape to it and like a multiple things to look at. So you're getting value out of all of these amazing actors in the same frame at the same time. I think it means our father finally came to his senses and cut this worthless little brat out of his will. So I guess you're gonna have to sell the Beamer and give your notice at the country club. Michael Shannon, who is one of my favorite actors working today, I was excited that he wanted to do this part because usually when Shannon shows up on screen, he can be playing very intimidating characters. He's incredibly good at kind of playing heavies and bringing kind of like a menace or bringing a strength to the screen. And the idea of seeing what he would do with a part that's kind of supposed to be like the weaker brother who's kind of trying to compensate for that by acting tough, but is not, not really there, that to me seemed really, really interesting. And he's also hilarious. Like after working with him, I, I, I think he's got to do more comedy. Michael Shannon for SNL, please and kick whatever fashion drug you're on, because if you think- This scarf, I just want to call out this scarf. Jenny Egan, who was our costume designer, I gave her the note that I wanted Ransom to be wearing incredibly nice clothes that he obviously didn't take care of. And so that's why he's wearing beautiful sweaters throughout the movie that have holes in them. And he's wearing, you barely see them, he's wearing these like Gucci loafers, but they're completely worn out. And he's like stamped the heel back on them and kind of ruined them. But this scarf, when she put that on him, I was just like, ah, oh, yeah, that's awesome. You think that after all the bridges you burned, after all the shit you said, after everything that you put this family through. Ricky Lindholm is a comedian, singer, and writer, and she's in this singing duo, comedy duo, called Garfunkel and Oates. And I've known Ricky for years. She had an amazing scene with 
Daniel's character with Benoit Blanc that is one of two scenes that ended up getting cut from the theatrical version of the movie, and they are both extras on the home video, so you'll finally be able to see her great work in this scene with Daniel, which I'm really happy with. And then Catherine Langford is awesome. She, as along with Tony, she, Catherine's also in Ozzy, and she's so good at accents. I slowly realized, like, when you're just talking to her in between takes, depending on who she's talking to, she will adjust her natural accent to match yours. And so when she's talking to me, she's talking in an American accent. Talking to Tony, she's back into her, her Australian accent. Daniel, I swear, it starts like lilting English. It's just, she has the, she's just so skilled at it. It's just like, she's not messing with you. It's just like second nature to her. And she's been working so much internationally also. She's like, every single movie she does, she's in a different country. So it's possible her brain is just not sure at this point what accent she's <laughs> actually is. But she was, she, she was lovely. And Tony, go what? The, the thing that I had seen that she had done before, that oh, she's working constantly. But, you know, obviously her amazing performance in Hereditary. Uh, was so intense and uh, I think it was fun for her to bust out this like California lifestyle guru thing and kind of get into a bit of the, uh, you know, get a, a little bit lighter than hereditary, just a little. You put this family through for the last 10 years that any of us are gonna support you, that any of us are gonna give you, like dad liked to say, a single red dime, you're nuts! Story-wise, Ransom, who is kind of a very main character in the movie. I'm not sure how far we are into the movie here, probably about 40 minutes or so, 45, maybe a little bit more. And deciding to wait until then to have him show up. One of my favorite kind of like movie statistics is that Han Solo doesn't show up in Star Wars until 45 minutes into A New Hope. And there's something about the energy of what Ransom means to the story. It's like a fresh breeze coming into the movie just when you kind of feel like you have a handle of all the chess pieces that are on the board to mix two metaphors. It kind of refreshes things in a nice little way. Don Johnson, ladies and gentlemen, my less attractive younger brother, Don Johnson. Uh, because Don has done his TV show, first of all, obviously working on Miami Vice, but also, also Nash Bridges, because he's done it for so many years. He's a director's actor. He's very aware of the technical elements of shooting. And so he's aware of what you're doing with the camera and why, and he's very good at playing to that. He's got an incredible skill, and he's an incredible pro. And I, I I think he's, he's quite funny in the movie. Son. Father. Did Harlan tell you he was going to cut you out of the will? Yep. I love Michael Shannon just doing that little thing, which, uh, why do I feel like we shot Shannon's thing first? So he, I don't know how he knew it to even do that. Well, and he's done what none of us were strong enough to do. Maybe this might finally make you grow up. This might be the best thing that could ever happen to you. Thank you. My mother, ladies and gentlemen. There's all these crazy, I mean, we've been kind of in close-ups for a while here, but like, you can always watch the movie if slash when you get bored. You can always just look at the background. And David Schlesinger, who was our uh, set decorator, he filled this place up with all of this incredible stuff back there. There's always something to look at, whether it's the paintings on the wall or the knickknacks on the table or what have you. All of that stuff is David. David Crank was our production designer. and. He and Schlesinger just really went to town on this. Look, this is not going to be easy for you. So with Ransom here, there was that other angle, which is kind of 45 degrees off to the right of this. And then there's this angle. And we have two cameras on him getting them both simultaneously, which is really useful um, because of eye lines, um, which is an absolute nightmare anyway. And in that situation, it is a it is a beast. Essentially, the deal is right here, Chris is looking left to right. He's looking this way at Tony, who's talking to him. And the reason for that is because on Tony's shot, if I can get back here, 
she's looking right to left. She's looking that way. So the characters are essentially, you feel like they're looking at each other. It creates that illusion. Basically, it's, it's the reason we have that other coverage on him is because there are other characters who have the opposite orientation, like Don is looking that way at him. So this would feel like they were looking across from each other. If Chris's chair is here, and Chris is sitting in the chair right here, this is Chris, essentially the camera you're looking at is low and here. You know, and, and Blanc is like back here. And the other camera for the other angle uh, is over here. And so this simultaneously covers, if he's looking at Tony, who's over here, so his eye line is this way. So well, you can see with this other camera, he'd be looking left to right, not right to left. But with this camera, because Don, he's like over here, uh, this camera covers for when he's looking at these other characters. So anyway, and we did that a lot. We figure out how to use multiple cameras to cover eye lines. Very occasionally there will be situations where we'll use two cameras and get kind of a wider shot and a closer shot. Usually not though. Usually we, if we're using two cameras, it's similar size on the same person. And that's because of lighting. If you take a look at the lighting on Chris, there's this beautiful shaped lighting that Steve has done where the size face is kind of shadowy. You have bright here and there's all of this equipment. There's probably right off screen here, like a massive lit up flag that's kind of creating that shape. And uh, you, so that's a lot of times where if somebody is in a wide shot, you just can't light their face with the same amount of detail. And so it, it doesn't behoove you to shoot both at once. You're going to be sacrificing one or the other. The other thing I like, again, even though this is for all intents and purposes uh, a close-up, the fact that you still have some depth back behind him, that you have Blanc kind of lingering over one shoulder and Harlan over the other shoulder, which I quite like. And that's one thing when you're, especially when you're shooting close-ups, especially when you're shooting anything with an actor, always trying to figure out when you're doing the blocking geography-wise, having part of your brain thinking, is their depth back behind them? It's always going to be prettier than if they're just up against a wall. Sometimes it's unavoidable, but and it can get tough when you're, because this was a real location. This was a real living room, actually, in a real house. And it can be tough because that means you're usually kind of like scrunched in, and it can be a battle. And a lot of times, it's incredible what you'll end up cheating uh, and what you can get away with in terms of cheating. Not in this shot. In this shot, it kind of like worked out. But very often, you'll have something where, let's say, if in the space of, of the room, the chair that they're sitting in is actually literally right up against the wall and you have to be shooting in this direction. You'll be amazed, especially in a shot like this where it's sort of a longer lens and the background is kind of out of focus. Very often, I mean, usually we'll, we'll pull the chair out an absurd amount, sometimes even like halfway into the room and find that when you shoot it, you can get away with the cheat and it just ends up looking a little prettier. But it'll be good. Nothing good is ever easy. Up your ass, Joni. You've had your teeth in this family's tit for a long time. Up your ass? Oh, very nice. Matter of fact, oh my God. eat shit. The original line, actually, as ran in the script, uh, it was fuck you instead of eat shit. And uh, so he was like, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. And it was going to be, but uh, essentially I changed it right before shooting because, because I realized that would have given us an R rating. And a big thing with this movie for me was remembering back to the Agatha Christie movies that I grew up watching with my family when I was, you know, 10 to 13 years old, like in that range, remembering how much fun those movies were, the whole family sitting down and watching them together. And I realized before shooting, you know what, I want this movie to be PG-13. So I went through, there were actually a ton of F-bombs in the movie. I ended up taking all of them out, except for two, I think. We got away with two. We had cast Chris at that point, so we were riffing, like, what should he say besides, F you? And Chris is like, I think a good eat shit always works. And I'm like, okay, well, sounds, I trust you. How's that? One of the nice things about the house was the natural light. It, it was a beautiful, beautiful setting. When we first walked through, my cinematographer Steve Yedlin and I, we just noticed how gorgeous the light was. Um, this is the first movie that we've shot entirely digital. We didn't shoot on film for this. Even though I love film and I wanted a filmic look and Steve did all of this crazy color science and added grain and added gate weave and added all the stuff you need to make it look like film, one of the benefits of shooting digital was 
if you shoot film, you just need more light. Um, and so generally with something like this, we would have big light fixtures outside the windows pumping in lots of light, and then we would be giving fill light inside also. With digital, one of the advantages is we could just let the natural light light the scene and match to that. And in this and in a lot of the stuff in the house, that ended up being a, a big advantage. No. Shit. Do not use that word in front of my son. Eat shit. If I Eat shit. You shit. Eat shit. Eat shit. I would slap that. Okay, so this is actually an example of where we break the eye line. And it doesn't really matter because he's talking to the other people. But I want to show you this so you can see if this were in a dialogue situation, it would be a problem. So in this, this is the eye line for when he's talking to Tony, so he's looking left to right. If he was talking to Don and then we cut to Don, you can see there would be a disconnect there because it looks like they're both looking at the same direction. It doesn't feel like they're looking at each other. That's why you pay attention to eye lines on set. <laughs> also, if you, yeah, just for a second, just because Don is yelling, but watch Jamie's reaction. Watch what Jamie's doing. <laughs> it's, I just love it. <laughs> you and I would slap that smug smile. Definitely eat shit. Eat shit. You can all eat shit. This little toss of the baseball, besides giving him just a little bit of business to do, it guides us into the next scene. Anything you can do to kind of do this in terms of the action of the scene. The next scene, the baseball is going to play a big part because the dog is going to come up and want the baseball and he throws it and that's how he gets the clue. So using this to kind of dovetail into what's coming next. I'm not eating one iota of shit is a Mike Shannon special. That's the uh, that's another one that he just like came up with. And here you can kind of see the layout of the room, and you can also see it's a big room for a room in a house. It's not a big room to stage a bunch of actors in, especially once you get the camera in there. You also have to kind of realize that getting the camera in is not just like a camera on a tripod. You usually have a dolly, and you usually have track laid for the dolly. So the camera equipment itself can take up like you know can feel like it's taking up half the room. So once you're dealing with real world spaces, uh, you're a lot more hemmed in than you think. You can actually see the tiny little detail, but um, this is the sort of thing that when we're talking about color management and what Steve does to make it look like film. So film does this thing called halation. And if you look at the bright edge between the window, between the darkness of the window and where it's flaring out outside, you can kind of see if you look up close, there's kind of like a rainbowy sort of glow to it. And that's something you get with film. You get on the edge of if there's an actual lamp or a light on set, or if there's an example like this, you'll get that halation effect that you don't get on digital. And so Steve actually wrote a script, that's such a tiny detail, but he wrote a thing that created that. And he would apply that to every shot where it would make sense. It's a, almost like a subconscious thing. You would never even look twice or think about that. It just adds to kind of the soup of stuff that we look at and we say, oh yeah, that feels filmic. I think we've covered it. That was a that was an extensive breakdown of the eat shit scene from Knives Out. So thank you so much, Vanity Fair, and uh, for letting me do this. And thank you guys for joining.